Hi, everyone. Hey. Welcome. We're, we're going to start in a few minutes, but while we're waiting, I thought we could just kind of, for those who are really um, brave and want to talk, uh, tell us about your experience with matcha. Or any Japanese tea. Yes. I can start. So I, I love matcha and um, I drink three to four cups a day and I just really love both the taste and the nutritional benefits of it. it it's just uh, my day doesn't seem complete without some. All I can say if you're in Brooklyn on a very cold day like today, Stopping in Kettle's uh, place in Greenpoint would be a great, very zen experience to partake. Uh, it's very calming, very relaxing, a uh, great place to be. And I say that living in Houston, so there you go. Anyone else want to go? Hi. Hi. Uh, yeah. How are you? I think I got on my room. Sorry about this. I'm in a lot of Zoom things, so I'll just try to <laughs> change that background if you don't mind. So I'm in Houston too. Um, I just like green tea. I don't know green tea by the names, so I'm here to learn. I When I go to a Japanese restaurant, I love to get green tea. I always get green tea. I have green tea at home. I haven't really thought about what brand it is or what type it is, um, but I just love to drink it. So. I know it's good for you and healthy for you. And uh, so I'm here to learn about the different brands. I wasn't able to get my order in in time. So I thought I was going to just go ahead and get some brand on Amazon, but they had the same problem. I only got one, which was Sencha. So I'm just here to learn. I don't know anything about anything other than I like um, green tea. So that's all I know. That's the most important Welcome, thing. <laughs> Great. So I will say, and, and, and Zach and I talked about this ahead of time, but uh, he'll keep that web page open on his site. Uh, so just the link that were, was given on the uh, on the Club of South Texas registration page, just go there and uh, I'll keep that page up for a while. Uh, if people want to use that link to order any of the tea uh, that Zach talks about today. I, so WH says, I like Gyokuro tea. I'm just going to mention that I grew up in the tradition of English tea, and my English father was adamant about having a proper cup, which meant heating the cup with hot water before you, you know, put even tea into it and how long you steep it and everything, and then adding the milk or cream, at, you know, uh, afterwards, after that's been put in as well. So I'm just curious to see what the uh, Japanese tradition is like. Right. Yeah, yeah I'll e echo that. Um, we are from Pakistan, so we drink tea the same way with milk. And, it, you know, the teapot has to be heated and, um, and it has to be brewed for a little while. So, and also we, we drink uh, green tea also, but we use... Uh, Sometimes use cardamom and cloves uh, in there as we uh, brew the tea, and cool. and sometimes cinnamon as well. So one of the things I'm going to talk about, actually, which we're already getting to, which I love, is how <clears throat> tea is this interesting vessel for reflecting the cultures where it ends up. So if you drink tea in Japan, or you drink tea in Pakistan, or in Russia, or in Taiwan. Uh, it's derived from the same plant, but it takes on a whole new cultural meaning because it, it's almost a mirror that reflects the style of how people gather, how people eat, how people spend time together. So uh, today we'll be focusing specifically on the styles and customs of Japan, but I love hearing more about how uh, other cultures and other people enjoy tea because it's, it's always different and always really uh, rewarding and enriching to, to, to learn about that. Because I certainly know a lot about Japanese tea, but I love learning about you know, other cultures and other styles as well. So Patricia, should we get started formally yeah, now? let's go ahead and get started. So let me just start with a little brief introduction here. I'm, um, first of all, I wanna welcome everyone to the IEP Masterclass on Japanese tea with Zach Mangan from uh, Kettle Tea in New York City. 
Uh, I'm Dave Johnston. I'm with the MIT Club of South Texas, and I'm really pleased that we've been able to join with the clubs of New York and Northern California in hosting this event. Uh, as an aside, I'd also like to thank my Brooklyn-based uh, daughter and son-in-law, Liz and Michael Whitetalk, for introducing me to Zach, uh, who is a longtime friend of, of Michael's family. Now that said, I'm sure you know, we're all looking forward to, uh, to learning more about the world of Japanese tea, but a bit of uh, bookkeeping or housekeeping here, uh, please, as, we're, uh, as Zach is presenting, uh, mute yourself. And if you have any questions, uh, go ahead and put them in the chat. And so I'm just gonna turn this over now to, uh, to Patricia Liu from the MIT Club of uh, Northern California and Zach Mangan, who's the founder of Kettle. So I'm gonna mute myself and uh, turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. Yes, so hi, I'm Patricia Liu. And as David mentioned, I'm from the MIT Club of Northern California. And I'm so excited for today's event. I would like to thank David for organizing this event and uh, to Zach for coming to talk to us about matcha and other teas. I've worked at some of the Michelin star restaurants that serve kettle teas and I've enjoyed kettle tea offerings in the past. In fact, I have a few in my cupboard right now. And uh, I love matcha for both its flavor and nutritional benefits. And I do drink three to four cups a day. Um, and again, um, please keep yourself on mute if at all possible. And, uh, and feel free to just um, place your questions into chat and we can um, ask those at different points throughout the talk. Zach. Great. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Zach Mangan. I am the uh, owner and co-founder of Kettle Tea. Uh, we're a Japanese tea company based here in New York City, and we also have an office in southern Japan in Fukuoka Prefecture. And I have been working in Japanese tea since about 2010. I first started working for a large Japanese tea company here in the United States, uh, and then started uh, traveling to Japan in around 2010 and uh, developed relationships with growers. Uh, now we, have, as I mentioned, have offices here in New York and also in Japan and we work direct. So kind of an interesting business model. We work uh, out of our office in Japan direct with all our producers. So we have relationships with growers throughout the country. Um, we have known many of them since I started out. Um, we know their families, we know, you know, each year um, what harvests they have, and, and uh, we really look forward to, you know, developing not only uh, bringing in great tea, but the relationships with the producers themselves. Um, we started Kettle, uh, I was bringing in tea, and my first customers, as Patricia mentioned, were restaurants. So when I first started, I knew that I had something very special in terms of the quality and the variety of the teas. Uh, and still today, I mean, I think a lot of Japanese tea is, is an emerging market. So there hasn't been a whole, many people haven't had a, a lot of experience with it, especially so when I started about a decade ago. Um, so I thought the best idea would be to take it to chefs and show it to chefs because they appreciate ingredients, they appreciate quality. And uh, my very first customer was Chef David Boulay here in New York. And he was, you know, immediate at, at the meeting was, was so interesting and cool. Like I didn't have a tax ID number. I didn't have any real business, so to speak. I just had great tea. And he uh, was kind enough to say, yeah, we'll put it on the menu tomorrow. I love it. And that gave me sort of the confidence to, uh, to understand, you know, other chefs might be interested and really grew from there. So we still work and support chefs and, uh, and restaurants throughout the country and in Europe. Uh, we now have grown to have a wholesale business where we, you know, have our teas in, in marketplaces, et cetera. And then we have uh, two cafes here in New York City. Uh, and I would say the, you know, what I strive to do really is connect these, these incredible producers and their products, which are oftentimes in very isolated and rural parts of Japan and bring their products to, uh, to here to our, uh, you know, to our audience in the West. So I've, I've really enjoyed it. I'm, I'm, I love what I do. We work, my wife, um, who happens to be Japanese, we met after I started the company here in New York. She's a ceramicist and we've really also grown the business to include ceramics, Japanese ceramics 
um, both made by her here at our uh, studio in New York. And then also we work with uh, ceramicists throughout Japan. Uh, so it probably goes without saying that we're gonna be discussing Japanese tea today. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to get into the details of some of the history, some of the styles of tea, uh, so, and health benefits. Um, and of course, you know, this is a, a, a two-way conversation. So I hope as uh, questions arise or if there's things that you'd like more clarity around or something maybe I don't cover, feel free to put those questions uh, into the chat box. And I know Patricia is gonna be doing um, some of the, uh, she'll be conveying those to me. Uh, so I thought what we would do is um, some of you I know uh, have ordered the tea and I want to say first and foremost to those who ordered it and it hasn't arrived I apologize we've had uh, in incredible delays here in the northeast at the uh, processing facilities for USPS so things have been moving quite slow uh, and if you haven't gotten it uh, I do apologize but the talk today will be recorded so uh, if there's you know if you wanted to follow along you'll be able to go back and revisit it and for those of you who did get the teas or decided they wanted to brew some other tea that they have a portion today we'll be actually going through how to brew the tea but i thought the best thing to do would be kick off uh, with a little bit of history just a little bit of overview of japan um, the styles of tea that are made there and a little bit of how tea got started. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and uh, pull up a little syllabus here uh, and we'll go through this and then we'll jump into some brewing after that. All right, so let's go here. All right, so tea as an overview. So what I'm talking about right now when I talk about tea uh, refers to the plant Camellia sinensis. So regardless if you're drinking English breakfast tea, you're drinking Taiwanese oolong, uh, you're drinking chai in, you know, in India or Pakistan, you're actually talking about the same plant. So Camellia sinensis is what we refer to as the tea plant. And it's a small evergreen shrub um, that's native to Southern China. There's also a version of this. Uh, there's Camellia sinensis variety sinensis and Camellia sinensis variety asamica. Uh, and they're both uh, the tea plant. They have slightly different characteristics. The sinensis uh, var sinensis is from southern Japan, or excuse me, southern China. And there's actually a variety asamica, which was found in India. So they have slightly different characteristics, but they're grown sort of along that tropical belt. So you see um, tea has now moved, uh, the diaspora of tea, it's, it's moved from China into Vietnam, Laos, Burma, Taiwan, Korea, and of course, Japan. Um, you do see some tea grown in the Middle East and in uh, uh, parts of, of Europe. You see a little bit grown in South America, Australia, uh, even the United States, there's a little bit uh, of tea grown, but in terms of commercial production areas, meaning teas that are, you know, at a scale that they're, they're in, consumed globally, uh, we, we do limit that to much less countries. So we're thinking Japan, China, Taiwan, India, Sri Lanka, to name a few. Of course, there's, there are others, but those are going to be the main areas of, of this tea plant. Now, one of the questions we get often is, well, what do you mean they all come from the same plant? There's white tea, so there must be a white tea plant or a green tea plant or black tea plant. And uh, it actually is an interesting, uh, you know, it's interesting that it's the same tea plant producing the same leaves. When they're harvested, so much of what, uh, you know, ends up causing the, you know, the different characteristics of the tea is how the tea is produced. So that's very interesting because you can take one tea leaf and it can be processed you know, many different ways. So um, the five main categories uh, of tea um, would be white tea, green tea, oolong, black, and pu'er. Um, in Japan, that narrows quite, uh, you know, quite a lot. So we're really dealing, 99% of the teas grown in Japan are green tea. So a lot of what we're gonna be talking about today is green tea. They also produce black tea and they also do pr produce some oolong. Um, now, what I would, but you might be thinking, well, what's the difference exactly between black tea and green tea or white tea? So green tea at its basic form is tea that is harvested, meaning the leaves are picked. And in Japan, that's gonna happen in the springtime. So the first flush when the tea is waking up after its dormancy in winter, and it puts out the small shoots, 
those are harvested. And that's going to start in southern part of Japan in mid-April, and it will move north in Japan to just around where Tokyo is. And we'll look at a map shortly, um, but it's going, to, it's going to go north to about mid-May. So that's when the harvest is happening. And that harvest of first flush high quality tea happens once a year. So those tea leaves are picked. And then what happens is their uh, process has to happen where the, the tea is, uh, the enzymes are deactivated. And that is by applying heat. So you take the tea leaf, you pick it, and then you apply heat to it. And what that does is if you've ever taken uh, spinach and steamed it, you know, it turns bright green. Uh, it activates the chlorophyll and it deactivates a lot of enzymes in tea that would um, cause the tea to continue to break down. Um, so that steaming process is something that's very, very specific to Japan. If you go to China, for example, and you buy green tea, that tea um, more often than not is picked and then it's uh, put into a, a wok, kind of dry heat. And it does the same process. It deactivates those enzymes so that the tea leaf stays bright green. Uh, and then the tea can be processed afterwards. And it's the same in Japan. But what's unique about Japan is that we're using uh, steam heat there instead of dry heat. So for just for, for clarity, what happens with an oolong tea is that the tea is harvested and then there's a period of time where they allow the enzymes to continue to their activity. And what happens is oxidation happens. So the leaf will start to oxidize and you can stop that oxidation along a spectrum basically from 5% oxidized to 100% oxidized. Now, if you go all the way into the 90 plus, 95, 100%, you're getting into black tea. So that's why your tea leaf looks the color it is. It was green to start, but as it oxidizes, it becomes that kind of deep brown, almost black. And the oolong teas, those are going to be somewhere, as I mentioned, in between. So they're going to fall on a scale of, you know, very lightly oxidized, meaning they're still green, to very deeply oxidized, meaning that the leaf turns, uh, turns brown, and sometimes red. Um, another question we often get, and many of you may know this, some of you might not, is when you order tea in a restaurant, you say, I'll have chamomile tea or a mint tea or lavender tea. When we refer to plants that uh, don't come from that Camellia sinensis, they're actually not considered part of tea. So those would be something, uh, you know, a tisane is what, what we refer to them as. That just means any plant that you can steep in hot water. But um, Earl Grey is black tea. It's blended with bergamot. But that bergamot flavor, that's actually not that's not a characteristic that comes from the tea plant. That's something that's blended in with the leaf. So you do see um, those five major categories. Again, today, we're gonna to be focused pretty much on green tea because in Japan, they drink primarily green tea. Uh, so quickly, I wanna just go over a very short uh, historical overview of how tea ended up in Japan. So it's a fascinating story. And if any of you are interested, um, I have a book coming out May 24th, which I can share a link with that we get more into the deeper uh, nuances of Japanese tea history, because it's just so fascinating. Um, but today we're kind of, we'll, we'll hit the finer points. So tea was introduced to Japan from China around the year 806 AD. Uh, and many things, including the kanji characters, the written characters, um, a, a lot of, of religion and culture, a lot of these things were introduced to Japan through China. And there were these, these exchanges, these cultural exchanges that happened and started around this time. And during this time, uh, monks, Japanese monks went, well, they weren't monks when they left, but they were monks when they came back. They were introduced to Buddhism. They were introduced to tea uh, in China. And they brought this these, these items back and they, they started to, you know, share them in, in uh, Japan. Now, I should remind you, when tea was first introduced, it wasn't anything like we have now, this elegant beverage that we enjoy as a, you know, kind of a leisure item. This was more or less like a, a crude uh, potion, like a, a, it was definitely for, for um, the benefit, the health benefits and also the caffeine that people were taking. So it was really more of a medicinal item at that point. So if you were to try and put yourself in that, uh, that time, I, it, I can assure you it probably did not taste very good. It was quite bitter. It was quite crude, but it was kind of the beginning of the introduction of this plant into Japan. Uh, so again, it grew then among these, these uh, Zen Buddhist circles. So it was shared among the monks. And for many years, it actually didn't 
uh, penetrate to the, uh, the wider culture of Japan, to the wider audience. It was really something that was, was relegated to these temples where people were using it kind of as a stimulant. And one of the famous stories is that monks would use it because they would be up meditating all night and they found that when they took tea, it helped them concentrate, it helped them um, stay alert and awake. Uh, so tea traditions then went on and, and again, in the book, I get into this to influence much, much, much bigger scale of culture in Japan. So it influenced Japanese cuisine by the, the tea ceremony or chanoyu. Um, it, there was something called kaiseki cuisine that was developed to go along with the tea ceremony, which is now, uh, you know, still to this day, sort of the, one of the higher expressions of Japanese cuisine and seasonality and the appreciation of, of the seasons. That's something that's very, uh, very tied to the tea ceremony. So we see uh, even in everyday life in Japan, how influential the, you know, the act of the tea ceremony was on the, the development of culture. So again, I want to talk about what makes Japanese tea unique. So Japanese tea, 99% of tea produced in Japan is green tea. Where if you go to other origins, they're producing oftentimes a mix of different styles of tea. Japan is very specific. And the reason why is it's what's consumed uh, domestically. So a lot of the tea still that's made in Japan is, is drank in Japan. So uh, they, they're known specifically to produce green tea. Uh, and I talked about this primarily that steaming method. That's something that's done in Japan that is very specific to Japan. And I'll explain a little bit later how that uh, turns out uh, to impact the flavor when you drink the tea. Um, there's something in their technology of how they pick tea and blend tea, uh, specifically a, a process called aracha, which we're going to talk about in a second, that's very specific to Japan, uh, and the impact of technology. So Japan has this beautiful combination of handmade artisanal uh, production in terms of the farmer working in the field, understanding the cultivars of the tea plants and the weather and the terroir, and then also this incredible access to technology in the factory, meaning they're able to be, you know, provide incredible consistency and scale. Uh, so that kind of, that balance between handmade and technologically driven production is something that's also very specific and unique to Japan. Um, also unique varietals. So uh, just to step back, what I mean by, if I, I may refer to cultivar or varietal uh, during this presentation. And what I'm talking about is very similar to wine grapes. So you may have wine at home, it's 100% Chardonnay or 100% Pinot Noir. Of course, those are both made from grapes, but the genetic material in those grapes is, is slightly different. So one has a red skin, one has a, a lighter skin. Uh, they may have a different, uh, you know, volatile chemicals that create maybe something has a little bit, a wine that has, you know, uh, a, a different fragrance from another. It's the same with the tea plant. And Japan has sort of pioneered this. They've been able to take and graft uh, selected cuttings together to create brand new cultivars. And that's something that um, is very specifically uh, developed in Japan. And while they do it in other countries, Japan um, does it extensively. And the main reason why they do it is to make the, the job of the farmer easier. So they may breed a certain cultivar to be frost resistant, meaning if you're growing closer to Tokyo or Saitama area in the north where it gets quite cold, you're going to have a higher success rate. Or if you're growing tea in the south where it's quite hot or you have a longer, hotter summer, you might want something that requires, you know, a little less water or that can, you know, flourish in very hot weather. So it's funny to think the artisanal side, which is what are the nuances of the flavor of each cultivar, but actually the, the, the reason that they were developed uh, initially was to, to make higher success rate for the farmer, meaning less risk for the farmer, meaning more people would want to farm for tea. Uh, so those unique cultivars are something that's very specific to Japan. And then, of course, if anyone's visited Japan, there's a real strong cultural attention to detail, and that expresses itself whether you buy sake or you buy handmade paper or you buy tea. There's something very specific and quote Japanese about teas and the way that they're produced with that, uh, that very strong attention to detail. Uh, and then of course, uh, microclimate. So we look at the different terroir, the different soil types, the different weather patterns. Uh, those are all going to affect the flavor of Japanese tea as well. So when you combine all those elements together, 
and then you drink your cup of tea, what you're tasting is you're actually tasting, you know, the steaming method, the blending method, the technology, the cultivars, that attention to detail. And that's something I was, I was talking about earlier. Um, the, wherever the tea plant goes, it really is this mirror that reflects the culture of, of the people where it ends up. So when, when I've, you know, if you head to Taiwan and you try an oolong tasting in Taiwan, the flavors, the, the culture, you're going to taste it. You're going to see it. You're going to experience it. Or if you're in, you know, Moscow and you have a tea ceremony or uh, you have tea, high tea there, or if you're in London, uh, you really get the culture of the people. And if you, in wherever you go, you can trace that back and see, you know, the, the taste of, of, of the, the flavor reflects the, you know, the, what the people enjoy, what they want to drink there. Um, and that's something I really personally love about tea. It's, it's an it's a interesting lens to view culture. Um, so quickly, I just want to go over a couple of the styles of tea, and we're going to talk uh, more deeply about a few of them. But uh, sencha. Sencha is going to be the most popular style by far. It's a vast category of teas that a green tea that is simply picked, steamed, dried, and rolled. Um, so maybe I can show you, for those that haven't got the, the tasting set, I'm not sure, I can't really see my camera right now because I'm sharing, but we have Sencha here, Hojicha, and Gyopuro. So Sencha is going to be, this is the, can that, you, yeah, great. you see it now? Yes. Okay, sorry about that. I can't see myself. Uh, so we have sencha here, hojicha. We can see the brown color. This is a roasted tea. And then gyokuro, which is a shaded tea. And I'm realizing too, maybe we'll want to talk about matcha today. So if anyone wants me to make a quick matcha to go over that, I can do that. Um, so hojicha, a question, sorry. Nope, okay. So Hojicha, after steaming and processing, this tea is roasted. So this is a very typical style of tea that's drank at home. It's drunk with meals. Uh, it's kind of caramelized and nutty. Uh, so sencha is going to be much greener, deeper, have a, maybe more grassiness. The hojicha is going to be roasted. Uh, and that's done after the tea is processed. We also have genmaicha, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. It's often served in, in Japanese restaurants. It's a blend of green tea and roasted brown rice. So it gives this kind of very unique, nutty, uh, flavor and texture that's quite popular. Uh, gyokuro, which is a much, much, much uh, less lesser known tea, even within Japan. This is a very special type of tea where the tea plants are shaded from the sunlight to induce this rich umami, to, to elevate the levels of L-theanine uh, and chlorophyll, which we'll talk about later. And then, of course, matcha, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. That's something now very specific to Japan. Uh, the tea leaves are shaded, processed, and then milled into a fine powder, and then they're whisked. So that's quite different. Uh, the, the last three, kamairicha, tamaryokcha, and bancha, are um, categories of tea you may have never encountered, and even also within Japan are, are much less known. Kamairicha is a type of pan-fired tea, like I mentioned earlier, that was influenced from China. So that's something that uh, you see more in the southern part of Japan that was open trading with China before uh, other parts of Japan were. And then tamaryokcha is also a, uh, a type of sencha that's not rolled. And then bancha, that's a later harvested tea that's uh, more drunk uh, countryside rural, rural tea. Yeah. Zach, there was a Zach, there was a question. Can you hold up the tea tray again, please? Sure. Can you see this okay? Yes. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Sure. All right. So quickly, I don't want to bore anybody, but I also find, you know, th th these facts about production very interesting. So the aracha is very unique. So one of the things that sets Japanese tea apart is that they're able to produce and harvest a lot of tea and then store it and reprocess it throughout the year to provide really fresh aromatic tea. So in the spring, the, the fresh leaves are picked they're air stirred and moisturized, which just basically holds the tea leaf. Uh, it, it keeps it in good shape until it can be steamed. Then the tea leaf is steamed to deactivate those enzymes. It's cooled, it's scattered, dried, rolled, dried again, rolled again, dried again. So if, if you can imagine what you're trying to do is you're trying to take a leaf that's about 90% water. There's a lot of water in the fresh leaf and you're trying to slowly remove as much water as possible. So those processes of uh, steaming and then scattering and all the drying and rolling, you're actually 
you're, you're more or less working the water out of the tea leaves. So the final uh, product at the end of aracha processing is about 5%. It goes from 90 to 5%. So you have quite a loss in water. Uh, now, the great thing about that is that tea is now stable and it can be packaged and it can be put into a refrigeration. And now you have access to fresh leaf. You don't have to worry about it degrading. Uh, if you were to finish it all the way 100% and just leave it there, air would act on it and it would start to, it, the flavor would start to change. You would lose the nuance. So in Japan, they can do this aracha process. They can put it into cold storage. And then when a company like myself is in January, you know, you know, nine months after the harvest, I can say, I'd like fresh tea, please. They'll pull it out and they'll, they'll process it. So that sencha production, that's what happens to sencha when we call them and say we need Tea. They put out and they pre-firing, post-firing, and finishing. And then when you open your packet of tea and you smell it, it's you're like, oh my god, this must have been this must have been growing in the ground a week ago. It has all this flavor and aroma, but it's actually because of that process. So it's a very specific way that tea is processed there. Um, tencha matcha processing that's slightly different, um, but it goes to a factory that that looks similar. But um, those teas are going to be processed to be milled. So there's, the, you'll notice there's no rolling. So those leaves are allowed to uh, be processed without rolling so they can be milled. Um, just quickly to go over some of the areas of Japan. So uh, if you can see here, this is, we have Japan Hokkaido up here. To give you a reference, right around here is where uh, Tokyo is, where my cursor is. So if we look, these are sort of the four of the largest tea production regions. We have Shizuoka here, which by uh, volume is still the largest area of production in Japan. We have Uji, which is by large the, the most culturally important tea uh, area in Japan still today. And it's also sort of the birthplace and really the center of matcha production. And then if we go down here, this is called Kyushu, this island here, this is the Southern Island. Um, we have Fukuoka, the kind of Northwest and Kagoshima here. These are two areas that are um, newer to production, but now producing very high quality tea. So um, Shizuoka, Uji, Yame, Kagoshima. Uh, of course, there's many others as well, but just for the sake of time, those are the, the four that I'd like to discuss. Now you'll notice too, um, if you look here, you can kind of see if we, if we were to split it in half or maybe even into thirds, definitely the lower quadrant here is where tea is being produced. And that's a, uh, a factor of weather. So if, you, if you've had great Japanese sake, oftentimes that's coming from the other half. So in all the sake regions, I never visit because I'm always visiting the tea regions. So if you're, if you're interested in great Japanese rice or sake, those tend to come from north of Tokyo up in this region where it's cooler. Japanese tea, you're seeing the production kind of falling to the south. And again, that's just because the tea plant is uh, able to uh, to, to strive, uh, thrive there, excuse me. So we'll go over some of that a little bit later. I think what might be nice now, is there any questions, Patricia, that you yes, wanted to get so to? so this is a great time for questions. I, I'll ask some now. So Travis asked, he lived in Nagasaki for two years and discovered Japanese tea and had many great experiences with local varieties. How does tea grown on Kyushu differ from that from other regions? Great. You said Nagasaki? Is that what it yes. was? Great. Yeah. Nagasaki is a, a, a wonderful area. We work with many great farmers there. There's a place called Higashi Sanogi, which is right on Omura Bay. Um, and that's a great question. Teas from Kyushu, because they have a longer growing season, They're, they have access to warmer weather sooner, they tend to be really bright, very fresh, and the style in which they process the tea, they really uh, amplify sweetness in umami. And when I say umami, I'm referring to uh, kind of a, a complex, savory, sweet quality. If you think about the taste of an oyster or the taste of mushrooms or miso soup, things that kind of fill your palate with this sort of rich savory note, that's, that's umami. So those teas uh, from Kyushu in general, which I, I love, I love tea from there, very bright, very fresh. And when you brew them in the cup, they tend to be almost electric. Like you look and you think, oh my God, that's green tea. Like you've seen green tea before, but this is like HD green tea. It's, it's really, really beautiful. So um, yeah, if you're interested in trying teas from Nagasaki, we have one called Asa no Yume. That means morning dream in Japanese. And it's available on our website and it's beautiful. It's uh, one of my favorite teas. 
And how did you pick Fukuoka as your Japanese office location? Okay, this is going to be a little story time. If you have two minutes, I'll tell you my the history of why this happened. Uh, when I was working in New York at a Japanese tea company, two gentlemen came in that were visiting from Japan, and they looked quite curious. They were looking around the store, and, and I struck up a conversation with them. They gave me their business card. They happened to have an IT company based in Fukuoka, and I said, Fukuoka, I just got some tea from there, and this tea was not anything that the store sold. It was something someone brought me, which ironically I thought was much better tasting than what we were selling in the store. So I thought now's a perfect time to make it. So I made it for these two gentlemen and they're drinking it. And at the time I didn't understand Japanese at all. They started talking to each other and they're, they're like, can we see the package? So I showed them the package and they said, oh, this is the tea we drink in our office. This is 30 minutes away from our office in Fukuoka. And they gave me their card and they said, if you ever come to Japan, this is so funny. We'd love to show you this, this farm. So a year later, the store that I was working at closed. And uh, as part of it, I got the small severance check, which at the time I was more money than I'd ever seen. And I said, well, I'm gonna go to Japan. So I took uh, a solo trip to Japan. And when I got there, I, I only had a couple of friends in Tokyo, but I emailed them. Can you believe it? I didn't even email them before I went. I got there and then I emailed them. I, I, my planning was, was not great, but they said, yes, we remember you. If you take the Shinkansen down, we're gonna show you the farm. Long story short, I go, they closed their office for the day and all the members of the team came and they met me at the train station and everyone had a gift. So they said, thank you for coming. Thank you. I, I feel like I feel like a dignitary or the president. I showed up and the whole company was there like I was a celebrity. I'd met these guys for maybe one hour. That hospitality was just incredible. So they rented these like these small vans and they're like, we're going to go to the farm. So they drive and we drive into the mountains and, you know, and I'm, I don't even really know the guys, like, but they're just, you know, they're taking such great care of me. We pull in, we get out and someone walks over. And he says, this is the guy who made the tea that you made for us in New York. And I was just like, you know, I, I was like, wow, the, the, just how that worked out. So I was struck. I took a tour. I saw the farm. This was before I had a company. At this point, I, I didn't even, hadn't even had the thought to start Kettle yet. But anyway, long story short, when I started the business, I knew in order to work with these great producers, I would need to be, I would, I knew that they were nervous to work with foreigners for many reasons. So I started to figure out, I made a list. What would it take for them to work with us? And I realized if I had an office that was domestic, they could work like a domestic trade partner. We could pay in yen, we could do bank transfer. If they had an issue, they could, you know, write an email in Japanese or call or fax. So I realized I needed to have a base in Japan. So when I started, these two gentlemen that I met randomly in New York said, we can help you. We'll help you get an office. So that's how we got set up in Fukuoka. So now we, have our, we still have our office there. And that gentleman who I met that first time when I went to that farm, he still uh, was our biggest trade partner. And one of the teas that you have, if you got the Sencha, comes from that farm in Fukuoka. So that's how we ended up there. Great. And then David asked, Matcha is very interesting to me in how it's made. Is there a reason the method to make it hasn't been used for other non-green types of tea? I believe the equipment to process it has to be dedicated to one type of tea, so maybe that makes it prohibitive to experiment or scale? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So even stepping back one, often we're asked, why is matcha really only made in Japan? And it's a great question because tea sort of historically went through three phases. Well, actually four phases. The first was it was a crude powder that was just basically like they would dry the leaf, they would you know crush it up and they would mix it with hot water. And that's like when I was talking about when tea first came to Japan, it was served like that. Next, it was, it, it was turned into cakes, compressed cakes, which you still see if you drink pu'er. Uh, and the reason it was, it was, one of the reasons it was done that way was easy to, it was easy to travel with. So they could stack the cakes and they could put them in a, you know, on a horse carriage and, and take them somewhere. And later, um, a finer version of milled tea happened, uh, which is what we would consider now, um, the, the, you know, this, this powder of matcha that was made. And then finally, we had leaf tea. An interesting thing happened after tea was introduced to Japan and matcha was was starting to be produced, Japan closed its borders again. So when it closed its borders, uh, it had a, you know, a century almost where it was closed off and it continued to make tea, it continued to make uh, inroads in how to, to produce gyokuro and it would realize, you know, okay, we should change this, we should do this. 
uh, or matcha rather. What happened was while they were closed, China stopped making milled tea. They had moved on. They were starting to make leaf teas now. So when Japan reopened, matcha wasn't produced anywhere or ground teas weren't really produced anywhere anymore. So at that point, it was like Japan was now the world expert on, on, on milled tea and it's just continued that way. Uh, and now um, your question was, why are other teas not milled? They can be, but true matcha is made on a stone mill called ishi usu. And ishi usu is made with two pieces of granite. We actually have one in our store. Maybe at some point before we leave, I can, I can take the computer and show it to you. Um, there, and, and in order for that mill to work, the tea has to be processed in a very specific way. If you just put, you know, if you put uh, English breakfast tea into it, you're gonna have a problem because the leaf will not be ground uniformly. There are places or other countries and even in Japan where they'll take teas and they'll use like an electric mill and turn it into a powder. But one of the other things with, uh, with, with matcha is the way that the tea is produced has a very mellow flavor. So when you whisk it, you don't get that strong astringency or bitterness. If you take something with a high level of catechin, catechin is an, uh, a type of antioxidant that's higher in unshaded teas and you mill it, you're gonna, it's gonna take the enamel right off your teeth. It's gonna be so strong. I mean, it's really hard to drink. Uh, so matcha uh, comes from certain style of leaf that's produced a very certain way. And that's how you can put it into the stone mill and make it. And then Latoya asked about how long is the rolling process? That's a great question. So there's several rolling processes that go um, you know, from, throughout the factory. But if you're talking about aracha, the first I would say is anywhere from about 45 minutes to an hour um, to really work that out. And the, the, it starts much longer because you have a lot more water in the leaf at first. As you go into subsequent rolling, uh, it, it becomes less and less and less. Um, if you, an interesting thing is if you ever get to experience it's called temomicha. Temomi means to be done, rolled by hand. You can, and I, if anyone's interested, I can share a link to a video. It's in Japanese, which you can see the process. Um, hand rolling tea, this is an interesting fact. Uh, it takes four hours to produce about 600 grams of tea. And they start with the, what looks like an enormous amount of fresh leaf. And as they process it and roll it by hand, completely by hand, the, you know, the water gets out of it, it shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, and you end up with a very small amount of tea. So um, technology really uh, accelerates the speed at which you can process tea. If it's done by hand, it's really, really very time consuming. People are very interested in the rolling. So um, after the event, we can send out an email with the link. Should yeah, absolutely. Link? Yeah, the Timomicha is a great video uh, to watch. I can send, I mean, uh, you know, you can either email me or if there's a way that I can send these links and you can share them, um, that's fine. But yeah, there's all sorts of fun stuff on YouTube if you want to see the uh, the production. And also in the book that I have coming out, we, we get more into the, the process of, of each step of the manufacture. Great. And David is putting into chat some of the main links for the Kettle site, some of the things that we're discussing today. Right yeah, and in, in the blog section, there's a lot of interesting, you know, like kind of intros to styles of tea, et cetera, that you might want to start with. So um, with that, do we want to maybe get into brewing our first tea? Yes, and uh, just so some people have questions about the brewing and things like that. So we'll ask those questions once you've gone over brewing. Sure, sure. so I'm going to do this. I'm going to put my screen down a little bit to show you. So. This can be a part that some people are quite intimidated by because unlike wine, which, oh my God, my wine friends, I'm so jealous. You just take the cork out, maybe decant it, and you're ready to go. You have no, no risk. Like you can't really mess it up. With tea, there's an, a huge element involved is yourself or the person making it for you. So the first thing I want to stress when we talk about being, uh, brewing Japanese tea is it's a process. So if you don't get it right the first time, do not despair. It takes practice. The more you do it, you'll you'll start. Your instinct will kick in. You'll ex have experiences, and you'll realize, okay, you can figure it out. And I'm going to help you guys today for sure. Get get very close. The one thing I'd really like to stress to start is water. Water is the most important part of brewing Japanese tea. You'd think, as someone who sells tea leaves, it would be in in my interest to tell you that the most important thing is the leaf. Actually, it's the water. And I say that because if you have incredible tea and not so incredible water, 
the, the, uh, you know, what you're going to end up with is much worse than if you have incredible water and mediocre tea. So what you look for with Japanese tea is you look for a softer water. So if you live, uh, you know, each city obviously uh, is different. Here in, the, in New York City, we actually have quite soft water. So if you run it through like a purifier, like a Brita purifier, something like that, you're pretty good. I know, for example, Los Angeles has quite hard water. Parts of the Midwest have hard water. So if you can find access to, and I, I think I might have put this in the email, um, Poland Spring is a great type of water to use. It's usually found in most places. I believe in, in the West Coast, Arrowhead uh, might yeah. be like a version of it. You can use Arrowhead. Arrowhead's a little harder than Poland Spring, but it's great. And the good thing is it's cheap. You can get, you know, you can get a lot of it for not a lot of money. Uh, it will make brewing like, it's, it will completely change the flavor of your tea if you're using great water. So you want to start with good water. Um, you don't need anything fancy. I'm using, I'm going to grab it actually. I'm using this electric kettle today. Um, you can use one of these. You can use a stovetop kettle. You can, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. You can boil it in a, you know, in a pan, just so long as you have good, clean, filtered water. Um, that's an important thing. So what we do with, with, uh, with tea, regardless of the style of tea, you always want to bring your water to a boil first, meaning a lot of times now you have the temperature controlled kettles and you can just set it to the temperature. But the problem with most of them is they'll just go to that temperature. So if it's say 180, it'll go to 180 without boiling it. So what I recommend is that you always boil your water first and then cool it down. And I'm going to show you guys uh, some steps to cool the water down today. Um, as far as a, a vessel for brewing tea, this is called a kyusu. This is a traditional Japanese teapot. This is, if I had to say what the best thing to brew Japanese tea in, it certainly would be this. It has a very wide lid, a lot of room. If we look inside here, you can see there's no strainer that comes out of this. So how do we strain the leaf? It's actually built, let me see, can you see here right against the spout? So this is a little sieve or a strainer that is built right in. Now what this affords us, this little pot, is the tea has a lot of room to open up. So regardless if you have a Japanese teapot or, uh, or not, you're gonna want the tea to have enough room to open up. Why? Because it can, it can let out the flavor and color. So oftentimes people use those little tea balls. I call those pri little prisons for the tea leaf, unfortunately, because the tea leaf will get stuck in there and you know it's, it, it doesn't get to express itself. So I'm sorry if you have a tea ball um, maybe it's time to retire the tea ball this year. And, and a teapot is a great way to start. Now, if you don't have a teapot, that's fine. You can use a cup like this with some type of, of, of strainer. If you have a kitchen strainer, you can put the leaf in here, you can pour the water in, and when we're ready to brew, you can pour that through a strainer. And that will actually still give you enough room for the tea leaf to open up, okay? So I'm gonna take you through brewing sencha first. So if anyone has sencha, or has got the center from us, now would be a time to, to get that out and get your teapot ready. So what I'm gonna do first, I talked about having to cool the water down. So I have very hot water. This is just off of a boil. It's about, I mean, I'd say 205 Fahrenheit. Uh, for Celsius, we're looking at maybe 95 to 98. What we're looking for when we brew the tea, we're looking for about 180 Fahrenheit or 80 Celsius. That's the sweet spot for sencha. So how am I going to cool this down if my water is so much hotter than what I need? If I put the leaf in now and I pour the water over it, way too hot, you're going to get, you know, a more astringent, less sweet cup. So I'm going to take, show you right here, I'm going to take my hot water and I'm going to pour it into this empty teapot. And someone was talking about this earlier about preheating the pot, preheating the cup, same thing. You're doing two things right now. You're cooling the water because this is cold, so it's absorbing some of the heat. And you're also preheating this so later on when we pour the water back in, it will keep it at a, at a great temperature. So there was a question about why is it important to boil the water first? So I'm not going to talk about science to MIT because I, I, I can see the comments blowing up. So I'm going to save this. Actually, I have, I have, if anyone, I'm sure there's some scientists out here that could help me with this. It has to do with the way that oxygen reacts at a boiling point. Now, again, I, I, I always pause here because I don't want to overstate my, uh, my expertise in this field. I, I don't know, but there is a remarkable change in the flavor when it boils versus unboiled. So if anyone knows exactly 
the oxygenation of water at boiled versus unboiled and what that might do to tea, I'd love to know. Actually, if any of you want, I have some projects. I need some scientists for a few things about tea. So I think I'm in the right place if anyone wants to help. Um, so I'll leave it at that. So we're boiling it, we're cooling it down here. And now I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna brew for two, two people. So I'm gonna use two, two teacups today. So these are two um, kind of smaller sized porcelain teacups. I'm gonna set here. And I'm gonna take this, this is empty. There's no tea leaves in it. And I'm gonna pour it into cup number one and cup number two. And I'm gonna empty the entirety of the water out. So now I have an empty hot preheated teapot and I have my water cooling further in these cups. So if you have a kitchen scale, it's a great way to kind of get a sense of how much you know a gram or five grams is. I've pre-measured, so I'm gonna take this off and set it over here. And I'm gonna take five grams of the sencha. You can see the sencha here. This is actually kukicha sencha. So you may notice there's some like green stalks in here. That's some of the stem, which is gonna give it uh, it's going to be a little easier to brew and a little uh, less chance of getting any astringency. So I'll put that in here. So now I have my tea leaf in here. This is a great way too to experience the aroma. So if you put it in your preheated pot, it's a great way to smell it. So what am I smelling when I smell it? So I'm smelling it's grassy, a little bit toasted, has almost like a hazelnut, like fresh cut spring grass, asparagus, almost like buttered asparagus very green, very fresh, very vegetal. So I have this. Now this, I'm just using, I'm not using a thermometer. Uh, you can use a thermometer. I just tend not to, I like to, you know, I've been making tea for a while. I can kind of sense by holding it in my hand, you know, if it's too hot. If you're holding it and you can't hold it, it's burning your hand, it's too hot. So I'm gonna guess this is probably closer to 190 right now. So it's a little bit above 180, but What's gonna happen is when I pour this back into the teapot, it's gonna drop a little bit. So I'm feeling like this is probably pretty much ready to go. Another way, I don't know if you can see, you can start to, to learn by the steam too. So if steam's going straight up like this, like really rushing out of your cup, that's a sign it's probably also too hot. So you want your steam to kind of start flowing like this a little bit. I know this sounds a little crazy, but you start to notice those things the more you make tea. So. This, uh, I also didn't mention how much water I'm using. For this, I'm using about 180 cc's of water. Um, so we're looking at like five to six ounces. So again, that might feel like a lot of tea to a short, uh, to a little amount of water, but the brewing time on this when we pour it in is only gonna be about 45 seconds to a minute. So let's go ahead and we're gonna take the water. And if you're using a one mug, that's fine. You don't need to use two. You can just pour all the water into one, into here like this. Okay, and then I'm going to let this sit for about 45 seconds. And while it brews, you don't need to shake it. You don't need to you know, disturb it at all. You can just trust that it's brewing inside. And um, one thing I wanna talk about, if you're serving for two people and you're pouring from here into two cups, it might make sense you think, okay, I'm gonna fill this one up and then fill this one up. One thing, as you brew in a teapot like this, as you get closer to the bottom, it's gonna get stronger. So what we wanna do is we wanna brew in a method where we go one, two, one, two, or if you have three, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, two, one, like that. And we go little by little. And what that does is it allows the, uh, the strength of both cups to be equal. So that's something you'll notice if, if someone from Japan makes you tea, they're not gonna pour it into one cup and then another. All right, so. How many grams, how many grams do you, should you use for two cups or two over so two cups uh, i'm still making i'm i'm breaking like one serving into two cups right now so if i'm going to double that i don't need to double quite i'm probably going to use about seven grams of tea or eight grams of tea if i'm doubling 180 if i'm using like you know uh yeah like 340 or or around there i'm going to use about seven grams so i'm just going to go now one two one two and I mean, you see how I'm rocking the teapot a little bit too? What that's doing is that's allowing the water and the tea to kind of wash together and you'll get a, a stronger color and you'll, you'll, you'll just bring out more of the color and the aroma that way. So I'm going back and forth like this. And why my left hand, I'm just holding the lid. You can also do it with one hand like this if you like. This is just something that's a little bit more polite in Japan to use two hands like this. 
All right, so now that I have it, I'm going to take hold it and I'm just going to shake out a little bit of the last drops here. And I want, oh, I wish you could smell this. So that's what the leaf looks. You can see how it's now all moved up against the, the strainer there. And I want you guys to see the color. This is going to be hard without me pouring it on my laptop. Can you guys see that? How bright green that is? Is there any, uh, when you do that, is, does aeration play into this as well? This was one of the questions. Um, there's not, so aeration plays in more when you're whisking matcha because you're introducing air into it. There's not, I mean, air is going to have an impact on the aroma for sure. How much, and, and I can't say, like, you know, aeration is not an element that we really think. We think of more, more the amount of tea, the amount of water, and the duration uh, and also the temperature of the water. So those are really the elements you can control. Of course, you can also control the material that you use. Um, but to, in my opinion, I don't get caught up in like, well, it's this type of clay versus this. Like those do have an impact, but I think for most people, the bigger thing you're gonna wanna worry about is does the tea have enough room to open? Is the temperature of the water, the amount of water and the amount of tea correct? And then the duration. So now I have this beautiful, tea it's not scalding hot so you might feel like well this is a little cooler than i like you can brew it hotter you just need to be careful and what i say is if you if you increase the temperature you're going to want to decrease the duration meaning you could brew very hot but you don't want to do it for 45 seconds you want to do it for about 15 seconds because what you'll do is you'll start to uh, limit the extraction of some of the more uh, bitter or astringent qualities so why don't we take a taste? And if anyone's drinking along with me, I'd love to hear some feedback, uh, some comments on how you would describe the flavor. So, itadakimasu. Grassy. Grassy? Nailed it, for sure. So there was a question that came in from WH very early on. He says, I like the Gyokuro tea, but sometimes I can't get the same sweetness as at home as compared to that tried at the tea shops. How do you kind of uh, control sweetness? Right. So he's, uh, I'd assume the meaning is the tea, the same tea leaf is sweeter when it's prepared at the tea shops and then he takes or they take that same leaf home and it's not as sweet? I, I would, I think so, yes. Okay, so my guess would be immediately the first thing I would think of is water. So water is an element that for, for extraction of sweetness and umami is going to be very, very uh, important. So I, I don't know exactly because I don't know what type of water he was using or they were using and the, the tea shop, but uh, for sweetness, softer water with gyokuro is going to increase the sweet. If there is sweetness in it, it's not going to create sweetness out of a tea that doesn't inherently have that. And sweetness comes from a few different, uh, few different uh, components. Um, so high quality gyokuro, if, if uh, we want to just talk about that uh, shortly. Maybe I can show a, a quick, fo some photos. Would that be helpful to show some of the Tencha and gyokuro photos? Can I do that? Sure. All right. So let's look at... All right, so really quick, I just wanna show you what this tea bush looks like. So this is sencha. So if you notice here, it looks like a very, very, very long hedge. So you can see here kind of this rounded, this is probably about mid thigh to hip high if you're standing right here. So it's not that high. Um, you see beautiful green leaves. This is right in the spring. So these little leaves here, if I can zoom in, they're what, they're what would be harvested. Um, now this is sencha. So sencha grows in full sunlight. So there's no shading. If you look to the back here, do you all see this, these black netting, this black netting here? This is one form of shading the tea leaf, which I'm going to explain in a second. But basically, if you were to go to Japan and see tea fields, you'd see these beautiful long uh, hedges like this. Now, interestingly enough, this isn't just one bush. This is actually many tea trees that are pruned together in a way that it becomes like one bush. But if you were to go to the root systems of these, you'd see there was many small trees under there. Uh, and now this is absorbing sunlight and will be harvested and will be made into green tea. But if we shade it, something happens. And this also I think would be fun to, uh, the scientific minds out there will appreciate this. So if you look at the left side of the screen, 
versus the right side of the screen, I'm sure you can notice a color difference. So this is actually the end of a tea bush that was being shaded. So if we look on this side, this was covered right up until about here. And if you look here, this, this part of the bush was not covered. So what happens is there's a uh, increase in chlorophyll here. That's the main reason that this is so much darker than this side. So I can see, you can see it here as well. So you can see a, a big delineation here between this side, which is growing in full sunlight, and this side, which was under the shade. So how I explain it is, um, this is tencha here. So this is what would be shaded for matcha. So what happens, a couple things. When you have a tea plant and you cover it, uh, as you reduce the amount of light, the tea plant responds because uh, you know a good deal of the uh, the energy that a, a plant makes comes from photosynthesis. So when you disrupt its main source of fuel, it starts to react. So the plant goes, okay, something's going on here. I'm not I'm not getting enough energy. Maybe it's me. So it starts to uh, increase the amount of chlorophyll that is in the leaf in order to absorb any of that light that's still making it through. So that's why you see a big jump in the, the, the color from sort of that like lime green to really, really deep green. Now, another thing happens in the plant. Um, when a plant is photosynthesizing, meaning it's capturing sun, uh, there are a couple of of components in it that are changing as it photosynthesizes. And again, I hope I'm not doing any injustice to science here, but I'll explain it the way that I understand it. Um, catechin is the main component in green tea, uh, the main antioxidant in green tea that develops during uh, photosynthesis. When the plant is not photosynthesizing as much, um, what happens is L-theanine, which is an amino acid, is originally in the plant, it, it, it transfers itself into catechin. But when you cover the tea plant, that transfer, that change doesn't happen. So you end up with higher levels of L-theanine that are still in the tea leaf. So when you harvest it, you have a much higher level of L-theanine. And L-theanine is a glutamate. It has a rich kind of umami sweetness to it. So when we talk about gyokuro, or matcha, those are both shaded teas. That intense sweetness often comes from that glutamate. So if we're looking here, these bushes, if you might notice, they, they're not pruned as low as the sencha. If we go back here and look at this, you can see this is quite low. If you go here, these are much higher. The reason why all this tea is gonna be harvested by hand. And you can see these black nets here. These will be pulled out over the tea bush. And for about 20 to 30 days, uh, from about 70% blockage to almost 90% blockage, uh, the sun will be, will be blocked out. And then the plants will grow beneath that shade. Uh, you, you, it, the plant obviously slows down. So this is, this is beneath the shade here. This is a very beautiful little uh, fresh tea light leaf that would be harvested by hand. You can see you still get at certain points a little bit of sun comes through under there. But this is what it looks like. So you can see the, the tea growing in the shade. And you also notice here that there's this straw covering here. This is a very traditional method that's different than the black nets. This is called Honzu. This is uh, used with rice straw. So the only less than 1% of shaded teas in Japan use this. It's very, very traditional. So Zach, there's a couple of questions. Lori says she has to go soon. So she was hoping to get yeah. her answer um, to her question. Why does the tea bag green tea tastes so much worse than loose tea. Why does the tea bag green tea? 100% yeah, it's, the, it's tea the, bags. yeah, quality of the tea. So we actually sell tea bags. Uh, I think a tea bag in itself is an amazing invention and a great piece of design. But often what you get is you get very low quality tea. Uh, you know, depending, it can be really, really tragically bad to kind of bad to quite good if you have, you know, if you buy from, from somewhere with quality. So tea bags in themselves are not evil. It's just a lot of the, the unfortunate tea that they put in there. Uh, and often too, it, it you know, it, it can do with uh, if the water's too hot or if you're using, you know, unfiltered tap water, those types of things will also cause the tea to not taste so great. So Zach, I'm just doing a quick time check. We're a little over an hour into this event and we 
still have about 10 questions. Do you want yeah, why don't to? We just, however you guys, I, I don't, I'd, I'd prefer to use the time, uh, how, how people would like it. If you want to ask more questions, I'm happy. I can, uh, maybe I'll just finish up the photos real quick and then we can get to some more questions. And then if we want to go over more brewing, or if you guys would like to make me to make some matcha for you to see that process, I'm happy to do either. Um, so why don't I just quickly finish these photos and then we'll get back to the question. So uh, I just want to show you something really interesting here. Can you can you see this starburst shape of this plant here? Yes. This is something I love the intelligence of plants. So this is a tea. If you were walking and you saw this, you would be able to tell that this tea was was shaded. And the reason why is you can see that each leaf kind of has shot out in a way where it can maximize its surface area to sunlight. So what happens is the leaves will start to arrange themselves in a way so that they're not, you know, or, or covering each other less. If you look at tea that's growing in full sunlight, they don't really need to do that because there's just an abundance of sun. But this is really interesting. So this star shape is something that you see on teas that are shaded. So I love when you, you learn like the, the plant is completely aware that it's not getting enough and it starts to rearrange the, the way the leaves are positioned. Um, this is also something interesting I would love to talk about is the fertilizer. So especially teas like matcha, uh, because you're limiting severely their ability to photosynthesize, they take more um, they, they take more energy from the soil. So using a nitrogen rich uh, soil will help to uh, not only help the plant to grow, but also to increase levels of sweetness in umami. And this is a type of human grade fish. Uh, this is actually from Hokkaido, a very expensive fish actually that this particular matcha producer uses. Um, so this is, depending where you visit, they all have uh, very specific formulas for fertilizers. Uh, this is tencha. So this is the green leaf that would go into the mill to be milled into matcha. And you'll notice here, it, it's not rolled, so it almost looks like little flecks of like a fish food or something, little, you know, like small, uh, small pieces. So the reason why is when that goes into the mill, it can be, the surface area can be exposed and it can be ground. So this is a traditional stone mill. So you'll notice this hopper here, that's where those tea leaves go in. And then it goes through this little, uh, you know, th through this cone into these two uh, pieces of granite. And if you saw a video, this would be spinning, uh, it spins counterclockwise. And this mill on, on the bottom, this piece of stone on the bottom is stationary. Uh, and that what happens is the, the tea is put through many different um, cuts in the stone. And as it moves through, it's more or less sliced into a very fine powder. So highly, uh, you know, well-made uh, matcha powder is between five and 10 microns, which is incredibly, incredibly fine. So this is a producer here, um, kind of explaining, you know, some of the nuances of his tea bushes. This is uh, the Furukawa family who makes some matcha. Uh, this is one of my favorite parts about sourcing tea is getting to know the people and the stories. So I know their family, their daughters, we have Actually, they, I was talking to them this morning, so we, we keep in, in touch, and uh, that's one of my favorite parts. They're, they're very committed to making high-quality tea. So again, that's the shading there. So that's a little bit of the process of, of, uh, of the leaf. So yeah, if there's some questions, uh, I'm happy to answer them now. I think you're muted. Uh, Patricia, I can't hear you. Oh. Yes. So there are a lot of people who would love to hear more about matcha and see if we have time to um, see the brewing process. Yeah, of course. You want to do that? Uh, are there, is there any other questions I can get to before I do that? Or I can just jump in and we can do that right now. Sure. Um, there are a lot of votes for the matcha. So I would just, we're okay. about 20 minutes left sure. on the program. So maybe Great. cover. Give me two seconds. I'm just going to grab a, a whisk and a bowl and uh, I'll be right back. Just be two seconds. I mean, I should point out that Zach is broadcasting from his uh, store in Greenpoint, in the shop in Greenpoint. So again, if you're in the New York City area, that's a great place to visit, particularly on cold days. All right, so 
we're gonna do a mock shot here. Um, oh, you know what? I forgot my whisk. Sorry. One moment. All right, thanks for your patience. All right, so for those that maybe aren't familiar with matcha, matcha is a finely ground tea, shaded here, we can see the powder. Um, at Kettle, we actually sell 15 varieties of matcha. So we love it, we take it quite seriously. And uh, this is one of our favorites, Hanaka. We sell this, uh, a lot of this, and we serve it in our store. Uh, so the tools you're gonna need, um, most importantly is the cha sen. Chasten is a piece of bamboo that's been carved into a whisk. So this is really, really important uh, in order to get a great foam. So I'm actually gonna bring my water back up to temperature for a second here. Um, so we also have the cha wan, which is a tea bowl. Um, this is specifically made for matcha. You can use a small bowl, it's not, you know, it's nice to have a, a bowl that you use regularly, but it's not, you know, imperative. So small bowl and the whisk. This is what I would say you need absolutely to make great matcha. Something like this, this is a chashaku or a scoop. This is going to help, but you can certainly use a teaspoon or something like that. Uh, a strainer as well. I recommend something to strain the, uh, the matcha powder with. So this has actually been pre-sifted, but I'll just to show you the method that we recommend, I'm gonna sift it again. So if everyone can see here, I'll try and get this down like that. I'm gonna take uh, the matcha powder and sift it into the bowl. And what I uh, recommend doing is uh, using two grams of matcha powder to 65 grams of water. So that may sound like, oh my God, I don't know how much that is. It's about three quarters of a teaspoon to about two ounces of water. The quickest and easiest way to figure it out is to use a, a um, food scale that just makes life a lot easier, at least in the beginning. So if you have a food scale, you can put your bowl on there and tear the weight, and then you can add the powder and then add the water. So now that I have my water ready, uh, I like to preheat the bowl. So I'll go ahead and pour a little bit of water into this uh, empty tea bowl just to warm it up a little bit like this. And then I'll go ahead and discard that water. So now I'm going to put my strainer over the chawan like this. Now, if you have a nice chawan and you have a metal strainer, just be careful when you're interacting with the, with the ceramic, you don't want to chip it. So you just want to set it on there lightly and don't want to push too hard. So now I'm going to take the matcha powder and I know that for two grams with the chashaku, I'm looking at about three and a half to four scoops. So inevitably everyone always says, oh, that's more matcha powder than I use. And if you're using high quality matcha, um, you wanna use two grams and the, the 65 grams of water so that you can get a very, very nice foam. So now I'm gonna run it through the sifter like this. And what this is doing is it's working out any uh, clumps that may be in the matcha. Fine matcha, uh, because it's so finely ground, it creates static electricity and those static bonds are very strong. So even when you whisk, sometimes you may have little clumps that don't come out at, uh, during whisking. So it's really important to make sure you sift. Okay, so now I have, I'll show you what that looks like. Can you see that? That's the sifted matcha powder, two grams. And now similarly to when I made the sencha, we don't necessarily want to use um, water right off of a boil. We wanna to go to about 180 degrees. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to pour the water into a small cup like this. And that's going to take a little bit of the heat off, a little bit of the edge off. So I'm going, again, for 65 grams of, of water, which is about uh, two ounces. So I have two grams here. Now I'm going to take that and just pour it gently around the matcha powder in order to kind of get it all 
uh, gently combined. I'm gonna add a little extra here. So now we see that beautiful bright green color there. So now this is where we get into the real, uh, I think, uh, technique part of making matcha. So we want to take our cha sen here and how we hold it is if you take your uh, thumb, index and middle finger and you take this little, you see this, there's a piece of string on the whisk where, the, where it comes together, it's tied. You wanna put that right at the front like this. So I'm holding it like this. And again, when you're using a chawan or a nice piece of Japanese ceramic, you always wanna handle it with respect. So we're gonna keep our hand on here. We're not gonna whisk like this. You really wanna make sure you're holding it. So I'm gonna pull up just so you can see here. You can see where we generate a lot of torque is we pull our elbow up like that. So we wanna pull our elbow out and we're generating the thrust from here. So it's gonna be like a paddle like this. This is what we're looking for. Da, 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 da. And it's all about RPMs. So you don't wanna just go in a circle. You don't wanna go lightly. You actually wanna whisk the entirety of the bowl. So if this is the inside of the bowl, you wanna go from side to side as much as possible to create as much air as possible. So I'm gonna pull it down like this so you can watch. And I also am gonna stop talking for a second so you can listen to it. Cause you wanna hear the, the tea whisk on the bottom of the bowl. So here we go. So you can hear that rhythmic shushing. We can't really hear it. Sam. Oh, you can't hear it? Okay, maybe my microphone is not strong enough, but I'll show you here. So I do probably the first 10 to 15 seconds, my cha sen is touching the bottom of the bowl. And the second half, I'm just, I move it to the top and I'm just going over the surface. And what that does is it works out any larger bubbles and it creates a beautiful crema on top. And what that's going to do is when you drink it, it'll be nice and silky. Okay, and then I'm gonna make a little circle and pull it right out. So let me show you what that looks like here. Can you see? Yes, that looks beautiful. So you can see, can you see on the edge that it kind of has a sheen to it? The light will bounce off the edge from the center to the edge. That's what you're looking for, that kind of bright crema. And now this again takes practice like anything, but uh, I think the key is to having the right ratio. So really, if you, if you get a food scale and you do 65 to two, Grams, you're going to be great. That's exactly what you need to get that. Otherwise, you may the, the tea may not uh, come together completely. So, so that's making a traditional bowl of matcha. And uh, if you're interested maybe in making a latte or something like that, if you go to our website, we also have on our blog how, uh, how to you know, successfully make a latte, how to brew all the other styles of tea as well. Now, just uh, some notes on drinking matcha. If you're ever in a Japanese tea ceremony or you're served tea, um, you know, uh, maybe in a Japanese restaurant, there's a couple of pointers I can show you when you're drinking. So again, a sign of respect, always handling the chawan with, with great care. So if you're right-handed, you're going to use your right hand like this, left hand, it would be like this, and you would use your non-dominant hand underneath to support like that. So I'll show you, we bring it up like this, and you would kind of keep your elbows out a little bit and always bring it up to you rather than kind of going towards it like this. You wanna just up and drink right out of it like that. So like that, that's the traditional way to, to drink matcha from a, a tea bowl like that. So matcha, it can be a little frustrating and it takes some practice because I think, you know, when you first start doing it, your wrists or your arm might get a little sore. You might not be able to generate exactly the right amount of speed, but the more you do it, you'll, you'll get the, the knack for it. And the first time you make your own bowl of matcha and it really turns out, it's, it's, it's really special. So uh, yeah, I hope, I hope you guys will try it. it. Sounds like Patricia, you make it often though. So maybe you've got some, uh, you've got it down already. Yes. I, I do, I, but I, I take shortcuts, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, another way, a great shortcut that if you don't have these tools, but you have matcha powder, if you have a thermos that can uh, accommodate hot water, you can put it in, same ratio, two grams, 65 grams of hot water, and you can shake it 
vigorously and then pour that out. It's not, it's an approximation. It doesn't do it, you know, exactly with the same finesse that the whisk does, but it's a great shortcut that actually still produces great matcha. And you can also do it with cold water too. You can shake it with cold water and then have a cold matcha. I mean, so usually I, I, I do sift it. I find sifting extremely important. I usually uh, add a little bit of water to the bottom of the cup first so that it, the matcha doesn't get stuck to the bottom of the cup. Mm -hmm. And I, I do use an electric frother. I, mm -hmm. I know that's heresy probably to you, Zach. Um, and, then, uh, and then for the iced drinks, I usually do a warm matcha first with almost like a paste before I add cold water just so that the powder doesn't lump. Yeah, that's smart. That's great. You, there's there's a lot of ways uh, to make matcha for sure. Um, some of them are listed on our site, but people come in with very inventive ways that I was like, wow, that's very creative. I wouldn't have thought of that. So, you know, the key is, is you find a way that works for you and you make it, you know, regular if you want to drink it regularly. But I will say a lot of people who might be intimidated by making it traditionally, the more you do it, it you know, you can make a bowl of matcha actually in less time than it makes uh, takes to make a cup of coffee. So it's quite it's quite easy. Thank you so much for that, Zach. That's beautiful. Yeah. Were there any other questions? I know we didn't get to everything, but an hour and a half goes quick. So if there's any other things that I can answer, anything that uh, uh, people want to know, I'm happy to happy to help. Okay. So I'll just uh, ask some questions uh, that came in. So Bronwyn asks, what's, what is Yuji Kabu Secha and what is uh, Kukicha? Right. Kukicha is a type of sencha that has the stem. So kuki means stem. Uh, so the, I, I, the sencha that I brewed, uh, the leaf uh, is blended with stem. So kukicha is a type of sencha. Kabuse. Kabuse in Japanese means to cover. So it's a shaded tea. So kabuse is kind of between sencha and gyokuro. Gyokuro is fully shaded. Kabuse is shaded, but for a shorter amount of time. So it's technically still in the family of sencha. Okay, and Agustina asked what matcha quality is best to use to make matcha latte? Great, that's a great question. Um, we sell one uh, called hukuju. Uh, hukuju is made specifically for uh, blending. Now, the thing is, it's not better, 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 because higher grades, you're going to lose some of the nuance if you blend it with uh, with milk. So we like something that's naturally strong and fragrant that will blend really well with the milk. So uh, again, on our side, I can make the, the suggestion of trying our fukuju. Um, I like teas uh, from Kyushu, from Fukuoka, for blending with milk because they tend to be nuttier and have more of kind of a chocolatey note. Teas from Uji in uh, the Kyoto area, they tend to be a little bit more oceanic, a little bit grassier. And for me personally, I don't, I don't find they blend as well to my palate with milk. So I tend to look for stuff from Fukuoka Prefecture for making the latte. So at all our cafes, we use our hukuju. Yes. So, and then there were a lot of questions about storage of the teas. And mm -hmm. I also have a personal question about using like the opaque glass jars for mm -hmm. herbs, um, using those for teas. So what's the best, what do you recommend for storage, especially the ones that were shipped out with the kettle tasting kit? Great. So that's a really good question. The, the main things you want to avoid are light, heat, moisture, and air. Light, heat, moisture, air. So those Japanese green tea is actually quite volatile. It can, it starts to, you know, lose its flavor and aroma quite quickly. So the, the best thing you can do is to keep it in an airtight, cool environment away from light and heat. So you'll notice I have this. This is a small, uh, Chazutsu, it's a, it's a, it's, you know, it's an airtight container that we keep matcha in. Another thing to consider is keeping teas in the fridge. So we recommend absolutely, if they're unopened, just keep them in the refrigerator. Once you open them, what you can do is if they're not resealable, you can put a little paper clip on it and put that in a Ziploc bag and put that in the fridge. Now, if that's going to be a hassle, you can, you can also split the difference. Like at home, I'll put half of it into something like this, which I'm using every day. If I have a large amount of tea, I'll put the other half in the fridge until I'm ready to use it. But uh, refrigerator, so long as it's not exposed to leftovers or fragrant foods, because uh, the tea can absorb that, that's the best place to keep it. 
If you keep it in the refrigerator, one of the questions I had is how do you prevent the condensation when you remove it from the That's a great question. So con that's, I think a bigger, it's, it's not a, as big of an issue as a lot of people think, unless you're moving from extreme, extreme. So if you live in a very hum hot human environment and you're going from the fridge out, there will be some, if it's in the bag, uh, as long as you're careful with it, generally you don't have to worry about it. But you would know better than, you know, if you have a very hot or kind of humid environment, you should be be careful of humidity because it can affect it. Um, one way to do it is just to bring it out of the fridge and let it sit for five minutes. Again, you know, if you're in a rush, that you know, you, maybe that's not the most convenient. So in that case, if you have, uh, you know, a possibility of humidity, I would maybe recommend keeping it just in a cool, dry place. What about those airtight uh, coffee canisters, not keeping it with your coffee, but those airtight coffee canisters that- Yeah, the ones that kind of remove, eject the air. Yes, or they, they control CO2. So it's basically like, um, so to prevent, so basically airtight opaque canisters. Yeah, I think those are fine. Those are great. The one thing I would say is try and get a canister that's as close to the amount of tea as you hold as possible. If you hold it in a big one and you're only putting this much tea in there, you tend to have more oxygen, even, even if you get the ones that kind of remove it. You know, if you use, if you, if you're buying a hundred grams of tea, a hundred gram tin is the one to get. If you drink more, maybe, you know, slightly more, but uh, try just, you know, some people have like kilogram ones and they're only keeping a little bit of tea in it. I'd recommend something a little bit smaller. So since we only have four minutes left to the event, uh, there was a question that came in about uh, the two other teas that came with the tasting kit. Can you just talk through the brewing instructions? In yeah, so kit? any tea that we sent should have instructions on it. The hojicha, uh, that's great. It's a really easy to brew, very fragrant tea. Um, I recommend, now I'm not looking at the package, but I believe it's about four grams to 150 to 180 grams of water. And you can use boiling water with that. And again, it's a pretty quick 45 second to a minute brew. Uh, you're gonna get more of the caramelized like sponge sugar, uh, nutty toastiness with that one. Uh, so that's a great one. Also, if you're sensitive to caffeine that has less caffeine, uh, both of the other green teas, if you are sensitive or you're not sure if you're sensitive, I'd recommend drinking it in the morning. Great. And then the, the gyokuro or the kabuse, which is the other tea, um, follow the directions that are on there, but just keep in mind, we're going to use cooler water so that you'll notice with those teas in order to bring out the sweetness, you're going to want to lower your water temperature. So, uh, that's just one thing to keep in mind if you, uh, when you brew that one. There were a couple questions about using the Sencha. Once you've brewed it, can you rebrew it? And what is, what are the kind of guidelines for doing that? Yeah, so when rebrewing, you certainly can. Most Japanese teas you can brew, you know, rebrew at least once, sometimes twice. Uh, I tend, because the leaf opens up, uh, on the first steep, what you're doing is part of that steeping time, you're actually, the water is penetrating into the leaf. Once you brew it, the second time, it's going to release much quicker. So I generally can, can say half the amount of time that you do on the first uh, when you're making the second steep. So if it's a minute, you do about 30 seconds on the, the second steep. And you can usually go slightly hotter just to get some of the fragrance. So uh, for example, if you're brewing 100, uh, if you're doing 180 cc's for a minute uh, on the first steep, I would go 180 cc's for about 30 seconds on the second steep. And again, play around. One thing I've learned in tea, there's no absolutes. It's definitely, you know, each person finds what they like. So a question on the teas is what is the average shelf life once you've opened it? And also, um, my question is how can you tell when it's no longer fresh and uh, it's time to not use it anymore? So the best way to learn when your tea is not fresh is to have experience with fresh tea so you can, you can compare. So I think buying quality tea and having that experience of like, wow, that, that's amazing. That fragrance is so strong then you'll sort of start to tell, even over the course of the tea that you're, you've bought, you'll, you'll, you'll notice. One big giveaway is fruitiness. If you're smelling Japanese green tea and it's particularly fruity, uh, that's a sign that it's probably been around air. Uh, one thing that we do at Kettle, uh, your teas that you all ordered were custom packed here in, in the States because it was a special event, but all of our teas are 
uh, oxygen free packed in Japan and there's a date stamp on them. So we do not reopen them here. One thing you want to avoid when shopping for tea is them bringing down a big tin, opening it, scooping it out. That's That tea has been exposed repeatedly to air. So again, um, that's something I'd look for in, if, you're, if you're shopping for tea is that they're, the teas are sealed and they're in oxygen free. Um, but tea does never go bad per se. You're going to lose fragrance and taste, but it's not like uh, cheese or milk or something where you could get food poisoning or anything. They're, they're, they're okay to drink, but they'll certainly lose fragrance over time. And Sherry had a question about the kettle uh, tasting kit. What type of tea is the Ayame Kabuse? The kabuse, the ayame kabuse, is, the kabuse is a shaded sencha. So it's sort of on the spectrum closer to gyokuro. Kabuse means to cover. So that we were looking at those pictures earlier of the tea plants that were covered. What that means is it's going to have a little like richer profile. It's going to have really beautiful deep green color uh, and lower astringency and lower bitterness. Great. And there was a question about the tea uh, cultivation is our pests and disease a big problem? Uh, yeah, so like any crop, uh, there are natural pests, there are um, types of, of diseases that will happen. Part of what I was discussing earlier about the cultivars, a lot of those were developed to kind of offset that. Uh, in Japan, in general, this is just a note for our company, uh, is quite responsible in their use of agrochemicals. Uh, so while a lot of teas are not organic, uh, we take it upon ourselves to have all our teas uh, lab tested and a third party uh, company will take them and, and scan them for certain types of chemicals. And uh, in, in general, in Japan, they've, they've figured out uh, a whole myriad of different ways to fight pesticides without having to use, you know, really strong application of uh, fertilizer or chemicals. So. But yes, I mean, like any crop, there's certainly types of bugs, there's blights, there's frost. Uh, yeah, it's tough to be a tea farmer, that's for sure. There was a question from Yasmin on, is sencha sometimes mixed with matcha in or other ingredients? And can you do a brief explanation on herbal teas? Yeah, so sencha can be blended with, uh, yeah, sencha with matcha. We sell a genmai matcha, which is genmai, sencha, brown rice blended with matcha powder. Um, you, know, you do see that from time to time. It's a little bit more of a new uh, method, and it increases kind of the color by adding the matcha powder. Uh, herbal teas uh, in Japan, I'm not sure if it was specifically geared towards herbal teas in Japan. Um, we sell sobacha, which is roasted buckwheat, which is actually probably our number one selling tea. It's incredibly popular. It has no caffeine, no gluten. Um, and there's a whole bunch of different types of, of herbal teas in Japan. There's kuromame, which is a black bean. There's burdock or gobo, which is a, a type of burdock root. Uh, Japan has a history of using a lot of, of different types of herbal, um, you know, dried herbs to create teas. I will say in full disclosure, not all of them are my favorite. Some of them can be a little intense or, or not to my palate. So currently we only sell sobacha, but we're in the process of working, um, this will come out soon, we're working with a really interesting chef to develop some new uh, grain teas, but that's uh, that's in the future, it's soon. And I saw on the Kettle website a couple months ago that you have a subscription service for freshly ground matcha. That sounded very interesting. Yeah, so we're, uh, I don't believe, I don't know of anyone else that's doing this. Uh, we buy each month from a different farmer, Tencha, which is the material that's ground into powder. Uh, and at the beginning of the month, uh, part of this set, you can, we mill it and we send it to you within 24 hours of grinding it. So it's really special. And uh, it's been a huge hit. We've actually, we closed it currently because uh, we, we need to sort of manage, make sure we can manage the experience, but we have uh, somewhere like 90 people or so are, are signed up for it and it's fun, but we're milling a lot now because in the beginning we only had 30 people. Now the mill's running all the time to try and get all that tea out, but it's very, it's very unique to get to try matcha right off the mill. There were a few questions about the caffeine levels of the different teas mm -hmm. and matcha compared to sencha and other teas. Right. Okay. Yeah. So all tea uh, that comes from the tea plant, unless chemically altered, is ha contains caffeine. And it is the same caffeine as coffee. A lot of people have this notion that tea has different 
caffeine, but caffeine is caffeine. So uh, I would say uh, matcha, because you're, you're uh, you know, ingesting the entire leaf, you're taking in more caffeine. The interesting thing is though, if you were to take a pound of sencha and a pound of matcha, per pound, sencha actually has more caffeine in it, but you ingest less of it because you're throwing away the leaves when you're done, you're not taking it all in. So if you're looking for a kind of invigorating tea, I really like sencha or the kabuse, that will kind of wake you up. Matcha has a tendency to kind of make you a little sleepy for the first 10 minutes because of all that L-theanine that kind of has a bit of a, a calming effect, but over the long term, you'll feel the arc of caffeine longer. So if coffee, the caffeine is kind of like this, green tea is more like this. It's slower, but it's longer and you don't go quite as high. So for some people that can affect them more. They may find they're having trouble sleeping after drinking tea uh, earlier in the day, but you don't feel that kind of racing uh, intensity that you get with caffeine from coffee. What about decaf teas? Decaf teas is something I don't, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about, I mean, they, there are processes usually by, uh, you know, there's a couple of chemical processes that can, they can remove it. And I believe it does remove a majority of it. I'm not in totally, in totally sure how much uh, that, you know, how much it takes out. Uh, again, we don't sell any decaffeinated teas. We only sell soba cha, which doesn't have caffeine to start. So uh, caffeine is hard to pin down. And anytime someone tells you something very, very specific about caffeine, take it with a grain of salt because uh, it's agriculture and it's depending on the year, depending on the batch, can, it can change. But across the board, green tea is caffeinated and it can be quite invigorating. So. Uh, we have a couple more questions, but I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We're um, past the half hour. So I'd like to thank uh, Zach for coming in to talk to us and teaching us about different Japanese teas. We will send out, David, I please confirm mm -hmm. that we can just send out an email after this event with a link to the recording as well as the link to the rolling process. Absolutely. And I think uh, there may be some guests that uh, did not receive some of our emails. And uh, so if you have invited somebody uh, and uh, did not include their email in the registration, please pass along any information uh, to your guests. But also, I think, you know, on behalf of everyone, Zach, we really appreciated the, the time you put into this and the expertise that you've uh, delivered to us. And, and I will have a, a certificate of appreciation coming from the MIT Alumni uh, Association. I haven't wow. received it yet, but Thank you. Is that an honor? That's like the honorary doctorate, right? Yeah, it's sort of like that. Yeah, I, was, yeah. I didn't you want can... to be forward, but I was thinking that, you know, just a little something to put on the wall. You know, exactly. Awesome. Exactly. Impress your friends, right? So, <laughs> right, well, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, I want to thank everybody too, Patricia and David. Thank you guys for setting this up, and um, this was a real. Uh, treat for me to get to to tune in and do this and uh, it's an open invitation if anyone is uh, in New York please come visit us we've got a small cafe in Manhattan in our flagship here in Brooklyn uh, and certainly there's uh, a lot of programming on our website and we'll be uh, developing that further this year so we'll be releasing a series of instructional videos on YouTube we do a lot on our Instagram live as well so if you follow either of those, uh, please look us up and we'd love to, uh, yeah, you know. Uh, and when's your book coming out, Zach? The book is coming out May 24th. I can send a link. Uh, it's on Princeton Architectural Press and I'm really excited about it. It's, it's, uh, it features, it revolves around interviews with the growers. So it's really great information. There's a chapter on health and wellness uh, with Dr. Andrew Weil, which is, uh, you know, really special to get him to kind of show his expertise within the health sector. Um, there's some interviews with chefs, there's recipes, there's all sorts of stuff. So I'm, I'm very excited. If you enjoyed this, it's going to be like a deeper dive for sure. We'll send a link in that email to Yeah. Okay. So, um, thank, thank you everyone for coming to the event and we'll see you at the next one. Great. Thank yes. you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zach. Appreciate it. Take care. Thank you. This is great. This is great.